Hello. In this video, we're going to hop back to a topic that was mentioned in video 7. We're going to look at waves bending as they go through one material or another. It's the process of refraction, but we're going to look at it in a slightly different context. It's very easy to see the effects of refraction, the bending of light, when we're looking through a bathroom window where the panes of glass have purposefully been given unequal thickness. Or when we're looking through this um, piece of bullseye glass placed in the middle of a household door. Again, refraction, the bending of light through different thicknesses of glass can very clearly be seen. Well, there are two examples um, beyond the world of our houses, and those are what I want to look at now. Um, you'll have either seen these phenomena before, um, or perhaps you can test them out, certainly during your daily exercise. One of them's universal, and the other is far more relevant to those who live um, near the North Kent coast. So the membership of either Canterbury or Saxon Shore U3A groups, for instance. Anyway, let's start with the local. And you can see on the screen here um, a map showing the feature I want to talk about. It's highly unusual. Some people even claim it's, uh, it's unique. Uh, but it's this feature running off the coast um, at Tankerton, which is east of Whitstable. Uh, it's a spit of clay with shingle and deposited by the action of the currents in the bay. And it runs almost perpendicular to the shoreline. Uh, it's been a local feature for centuries and it's simply known as the street. At low tide it's possible to walk out along it for several hundred metres. Uh, and even at high tide it's still evident from the top of the slopes above the beach uh, and can be seen in satellite images as you can see here. Well let's have a look at um, photographs that I took a few years ago. They're not terribly good, forgive me, uh, but this is, um, this is an image of the street. It's not at low tide but it's very close to low tide and you can see vaguely how big it is just from the, uh, the people that are walking out along it. Uh, if we look off, oh, this is just another view um, of the street out towards the Isle of Sheppey, but if we uh, look off to the sides uh, of the street whilst we're on it, uh, we can observe what's happening um, to the waves. And you'll notice that whilst they are going in towards the shore in a fairly typical unexpected manner over here, they're actually beginning to curve round uh, to either side. So the same here, they're heading towards the shore. As we get close to the street, they're curving, curving around. And I've just sort of drawn some lines on top here uh, freehand in order to try and illustrate uh, that effect. Well, the obvious question at this point is why? Why does the direction of the wave, uh, the waves change as we get towards the, uh, the street? We can go beyond this local manifestation um, and, um, and consider something that everyone could try and observe. The fact that sound seems to carry further at night. Well, it turns out that both of those observations can be explained by exactly the same physics. Uh, and it's the same physics as we used when we talked about the bending of light as it travelled through glass. Uh, we did that within, um, and water in fact, we did that within um, video 7. And this is the um, phenomenon labelled as refraction. So it's refraction that explains uh, both of these um, effects that we can observe in, in nature. All waves may be subject to refraction, 
waves on water, sound waves, or light waves. So as we saw in video seven in this series, uh, if we have light coming in from air to glass, we looked at the action of a prism, for instance, uh, its direction will be changed. And in fact, if it glows from the glass back out into air again, the direction will change again. In fact, this will change to be in exactly the same direction as that, which I suppose we might expect. So we had a look at this uh, in relation to a prism and in fact to um, droplets of water. We looked at the origins of rainbows, if you remember, which comes out of this. Now the reason for this effect, the reason for this bending of the light ray, a process, remember, we called refraction, uh, is that the speed of light in air is not the same as the speed of light in glass. And in fact it was even more subtle than that, you'll recall. Um, the speed of light in a glass actually depends on the wavelength of the light, the colour of the light. Now it turns out that the degree to which refraction occurs the degree to which the direction of the wave changes, in other words, uh, is actually determined by the ratio of the speed in one medium divided by the speed in the other. So in the case of our example up here, it's the speed of light in air, the speed of light in glass. But in general, whatever that medium is, let's label it one, let's label this two. So in general terms, we could say that it's to do with the ratio um, of the speed of the wave in whatever the first medium is divided by the speed of the wave in whatever the second medium is. Uh, in our example, of course, it's air and glass, but it could be, uh, this could be water, for instance. We can see this effect uh, in water as well, in the context of waves on water. The speed of the wave uh, varies depending on the depth of the water. So if we go from uh, deep water into shallow water, we'll see uh, refraction taking place. Because the wave speed, the speed of the waves on the water, actually decreases as the depth of the water decreases. So if we have uh, waves coming in to our boundary like this, so they're traveling in that direction, in other words, um, then when they get into the shallower water, something happens. They actually travel in a different direction. The direction of the waves, in other words, has been altered. We've had refraction taking place. And this is the explanation behind uh, seeing that curvature to the waves uh, at the edge of the street in Tankerton Whitstable. Um, it's because the depth of the water is changing as we get onto this spit of land. Now we don't have an abrupt boundary between deep water and shallow water in that case, we have a gradual change, which means we don't likewise have an abrupt change in direction, we have a gradual change and that's exactly what you saw uh, on that photograph. But it's all because the depth of the water is getting progressively shallower and the wave direction is changing. Uh, now we can look at this in the context of sound as well. So we're in slightly different uh, territory here. 
uh, we're actually going to be making uh, use of the fact that the speed of sound uh, in air changes. So if we look at the speed of sound at naught degrees centigrade, um, it's about 331 meters per second. If we warm our air up to 20 degrees centigrade, this increases to 343 meters per second. Quite an appreciable change. So you just have to remember that this process of refraction, remember, uh, depends on moving from one medium into another where the speed of the wave has changed. So there's no reason why this can't be cooler air and warmer air uh, in our case here. So what we actually see, if I make a little bit of space for myself here, is a difference between daytime and nighttime that depends on the relative temperature of the air as we move from the ground. So if we look at daytime, uh, the ground or the air near the ground is warmer. That's simply because the sun is heating the ground and the ground is heating the air. So relatively speaking then, the air further above is cooler. And remember we've got gradations of temperature involved here. Uh, and what that does in terms of sound created at the surface, so somebody speaking, an animal making a noise or whatever, uh, is that we have refraction occurring and our sound wave being refractive bent, in other words, upwards. Now, the opposite is true at night time. Uh, the air nearest the ground is cooler at night time. Just think that we get frost on the ground before we get frost on the roofs of our buildings, for instance. Um, and again, relatively speaking, it's warmer further up. So we have the opposite effect, in other words. If we have a sound that's created near um, the ground, uh, it actually gets refracted in the opposite direction. And that's the reason why sound carries further at night time. In the day, it's being carried away from ground level. At night time, it tends to stay closer to it. So refraction is explaining both phenomena, waves on the sea near this spit of land and the fact that sound carries further at night. And all this comes about, remember, because we have a ratio of wave speeds in one medium to the other. And this is a phenomenon, this description of refraction, maybe without things like the speed of light being thrown in, but nevertheless, this generic form uh, you'll find in most textbooks referred to as Snell's Law. And this is quite a big thing. Uh, this relationship in physics, for instance, will explain for us how uh, technology based on fiber optic cables works, for instance. But I'm not going to be getting into that in this video. That's a big topic in its own right. If you look in textbooks, you'll find these phenomena under the heading of Snell's Law, usually. Uh, but this opens up a whole issue of labelling within science. Um, Snell certainly did work on the phenomenon, and so did many others. Uh, this list just contains four examples uh, of the people who worked on it quite independently from one another. And in fact, um, even the ancient Greeks looked at this in some detail. Does Snell deserve to have 
um, this law named after him, this description of uh, a widespread physical phenomenon? Well, it's an open question. It's a question associated with all sorts of studies within the history of science. But actually, we could make very similar observations, or ask the same sort of questions um, in association with what we think of as the work of Galileo or Darwin or Einstein or countless others. Um, they're all derived from the abiding myth of the lone genius. Uh, we seem to need to ascribe sole credit to a single person and historically that's usually male but that will be a digression I think to discuss that that's far too long for this video. I'll put in some links in the blurb that go with it on my blog in case you want to dig further.